Cryoneurotomy to reduce spasticity and improve range of motion in the spastic flexed elbow, a visual vignette. We have chosen to use this format to demonstrate the changes in range of motion, speed of movement, and end range. We retrospectively reviewed the charts of 11 patients with the longest follow-up after cryoneurotomy. Each patient had undergone a diagnostic nerve block to the brachialis branch of the musculocutaneous nerve as seen in this visualization. This was to identify the contribution of the musculocutaneous nerve to the spastic flexed elbow pattern. Each patient that was retrospectively reviewed had improvements in range of motion and went on to have a cryoneurotomy. We have chosen to include six patients for visualization in this vignette. Patients that demonstrated increased range of motion after their diagnostic nerve block were selected to go on to have a cryoneurotomy using a Wesco Lloyd 2000 Neurostat console which uses carbon dioxide to form an ice ball to form a neurotomy and lesion. The cryoneurotomy is performed as a percutaneous procedure through a thermal insulating catheter into the skin where an ice ball is formed by the gas and put in place for four to six minutes next to the nerve. Here we demonstrate the formation of the ice ball in a normal saline syringe. The ice ball begins to form immediately after the gas is turned on and the ice ball will generate in size. As soon as the gas is turned off, the ice ball will shrink and it can be removed through the skin. It is possible to watch the cryoprobe under ultrasound guidance touch the nerve, stay in place while the ice ball is formed and the location is confirmed using e-stimulation to watch muscle contraction. Then the ice ball is formed and the neurotomy takes place. The musculocutaneous nerve can be performed in the classic medial approach. However, with ultrasound guidance, it is also possible to put the patient in a more comfortable position in order to perform a lateral approach seen on the entry point here. As with all diagnostic nerve blocks, it is crucial to ensure that the e-stimulation threshold is 0.8 milliamps or below in order to confirm that you are next to the nerve and not just overstimulating the muscle fibers themselves. In our first case, the top screen shows before any treatment on the modified TARDU scale, the fast catch described as the V3. The V1 on the modified TARDU scale demonstrates the maximum range when done slowly. This is often presumed to be the maximal range and anything beyond that to be contracture. This patient underwent his first diagnostic nerve block. You can see the difference is the V3 is very difficult to appreciate and he goes to his maximum range of motion right away. The arm moves more quickly. This patient underwent a cryoneurotomy. You can see again it is difficult to see the first fast V3 catch. His V1 is actually exceeded and he goes to essentially maximum range of motion. The patient had not yet tried to achieve his full arm extension and is actively demonstrating his range of motion. Incidentally, this is the same angle that he achieved as his maximum range of motion prior to the cryoneurotomy when it was done passively. At two and a half months, his range of motion is improving actively. We decided to put his botulinum toxin that would have gone into the brachialis muscle into the brachioradialis and his tight finger flexors. And one month later, at three and a half months, he is improving. He is seen here at six months time before he has his next botulinum toxin injection. He indicates he now has the strength to pick up his grandchildren and use the lawnmower. One year after cryoneurotomy, the changes in the movement pattern are observed. At 26 months, he has not had a botulinum toxin injection in over five months due to the COVID-19 pandemic. His range of motion is maintained. He also notes that he continues to feel strength as he is seen pulling the examiner on a wheeled stool. Our second patient is seen nine years after stroke. The interventional anesthesiologist is again demonstrating the fast V3 component of the TARDU scale, as well as the maximum range of motion slowly, or the V1. Nine days after cryoneurotomy, the difference in active range of motion is demonstrated. Please note, active range of motion is a reflection of the movement in the extensor muscles, but we can see the change of range of motion after the flexors are targeted. 
one month post procedure, one can see the difference in the V3 and the V1 in the speed of movement. There is still a notable catch, however, in the muscle presumed to be from the brachial radialis based on her presentation. As part of our clinical decision making, the brachial radialis was blocked with a 2cc lidocaine nerve block to the brachial radialis muscle. Thus, the patient had a second crown neurotomy, this time to the radial nerve branch to the brachial radialis, and the change in range of motion is seen here both actively and passively. This patient also had diversion of their botulinum toxin injections from their brachialis and brachial radialis. They have not had a botulinum toxin injection in more than five months when this occurred. This is 26 months after the first crown neurotomy. In this patient with a spinal cord injury, again, we see a classic fast catch V3 and a maximum range of motion V1, and we note the changes after the diagnostic nerve block. The patient also had a diagnostic nerve block to the radial nerve to assess its individual contribution. The patient first underwent the musculocutaneous nerve crown neurotomy and subsequently had a radial nerve crown neurotomy based on the improvement we had seen from the original nerve block. In this stroke patient, we again see on the left side the resistance to movement in the V3 and the V1 and her active range of motion. On the right side, it is her post-block range of motion and the final movement that she does is actually actively without any assistance from the examiner. The lesion of the ice ball acts immediately and we see a change at five minutes after the crown neurotomy. However, Wallerian degeneration of the axon will take place in the days and months after. In crown neurotomy, we know that the epineurium and perineum are intact, serving as a tunnel for the nerve to regenerate at the classic length dependent fashion of approximately a millimeter per day. Six weeks after the injection, her range of motion has improved. We do a reassessment, noting that she has some tone in both her brachioradialis and her triceps, and that will be our next plan to target with botulinum toxin. Here we see the maintenance of her crown neurotomy at six months post-procedure. In this stroke patient, we once again demonstrate the change in range of motion passively with a diagnostic nerve block to the musculocutaneous nerve. Her active range of motion notes that there's clonus that is interrupting her movement pattern. A passive assessment is performed one month after the crown rodomy. One can see the difference in the end range of motion here. We see here her active range of motion. There is still considerable clonus happening, particularly at end range of motion. This is clearly not coming from the brachialis muscle and is coming from a different set that requires assessment. At three months post procedure, the range of motion is again improving, particularly passively. However, the clonus persists and an intervention is required by our team. Our clinical assessment determined that the clonus was coming from the wrist and finger flexors. This was the same patient after botulinum toxin injections that were added to the flexor digitorum superficialis and flexor carpi radialis. 18 months after cryonerotomy, she continues to have improved movements in the elbow. It has been many months due to the pandemic in her finger flexor injections and the clonus is to beginning to return. Our final case again demonstrates our treatment algorithm. We did not feel that this initial block to the musculocutaneous nerve resolved the tone the way we wished. We therefore added in another block, this time radial nerve to the brachial radialis after this, and she went on to have her cryoneurotomies. She had a combined musculocutaneous and radial cryoneurotomy after the first injection series. You can see initially the V3 is still somewhat tight, but her range of motion is beginning to improve at this point. At seven and a half months after cryoneurotomy, she's had no further botulinum toxin injections due to the pandemic and the range of motion has improved. This concludes our visual vignette of our retrospective cohort. 
we do hope it allowed the viewer to come to their own conclusions. We chose the visual vignette to demonstrate our novel approach and our novel technique and our treatment decision pathway. We do note that the changes noted to each arm were maintained and it seemed to approve over time. The two patients that were observed at over two years maintained their changes. Thank you.